Welcome to Wizards Institute, the number one community to learn smart investing and financial independence. Kai Wu is the founder and chief investment officer of Sparkline Capital, a hedge fund applying state-of-the-art machine learning to mine unstructured data sets with the aim to generate consistent alpha and profits. Prior to this, Kai co-founded and co-managed a quantitative hedge fund with $350 million in AUM, as well as having worked at GMO, where he was a member of Jeremy Grantham's $40 billion asset allocation team. Our discussion will center on investing, particularly value investing in the machine age, how big tech and deep learning is disrupting traditional investment models, and how investors must heed these trends. Great. Uh, tonight we have uh, Kai Wu, CEO and founder of Sparkline Capital. I am super excited and looking forward to, to this talk. I, I haven't met Kai for a long time, but since reading his pieces of research, uh, especially August and September, I've been chasing him to give me an hour's time to share uh, his thoughts on investing. Um, and uh, I really wanted to share Kai's uh, insights with the book audience as well as the Wizards in, uh, community just because I read so much, I talk to so many investors and um, Kai really has um, some amazing insight. So, so let, let's get started. Kai, um, perhaps you could tell us a bit about yourself and Spark, uh, Sparkling uh, Capital and we'll go from there. Sure, yeah. So my parents are from Taiwan. I was born and raised in the Boston suburbs and uh, went to Harvard, uh, initially focused on government and wanted to go into politics, but then quickly pivoted into economics because it was much more, let's call it synergistic with my quantitative event. And, you know, I, I never really was interested in financial markets growing up, right? My dad's a, a doctor, my mom's an artist and really only got my first exposure to business my sophomore year when I did an internship on Wall Street, actually for Citigroup. Um, in the m a group and you know keep in mind that a lot of people grew up reading the wall street journal following warren buffett i did none of this right i had no idea what banking even was um, until a recruiter showed up on campus and wrote me in so that was a kind of eye-opening experience and you know keep in mind that this was during the teeth of the financial crisis so you know this is right during lehman and bear stearns and all that so super interesting it kind of got my mind thinking more about financial crises and um, I took a tutorial with a guy named Ken Rogoff, um, who later became my thesis advisor. And his focus, he wrote a book called This Time is Different, where he looked at hundreds of years of financial crises. And I ended up writing my thesis on, a, on this topic, where I kind of took an interesting kind of rebellious bent. I focused on Austrian economics and credit cycles, which, you know, if you know anything about the Harvard Economics Department, um, is kind of the opposite of what they do. But look, the idea here was simple, which is maybe we can't predict the actual event that will catalyze a crisis, but we can, we can focus on what the imbalances that build up are before that and say, this is an, an unsustainable um, imbalance. So, you know, think about classical economics focuses on equilibrium, right? We, what, what I focused on was the fact that, look, we never really spend our time in equilibrium. We only really go to equilibrium when we're passing through either from the top or the bottom. We spend most of our time in these cycles either kind of above or below these, you know, the kind of idea of self-reinforcing mechanisms and credit and asset prices, um, consumer confidence, all these things. And so that was kind of really what got me into macroeconomics and what ultimately led me to GMO. Um, so Grantham Mayo Van Otterloo was the first firm I worked for at college. Um, you know, the, you know, I joined right after the financial crisis, at which point the firm was doing extremely well. You know, Jeremy Grantham, the founder, was very in predicting the financial crisis, subprime, housing bubble, et cetera, and we did very well in the portfolios. And you know, what kind of got me to my next phase in my evolution was um, you know, the fact that you know, GMO was actually, and you, know, may, you may not know this, um, had its roots in quantitative investing. So when Jeremy founded it with his two co-founders in the 70s on their traditional stock pickers, but he quickly realized that there was a lot of value in using systematic factor-based investing. So he was one of the pioneers of the idea of value, small kind of the of French factors that are now so popular, but he was doing this way before. And he, you know, expanded it into international and emerging investing and then um, asset allocation. 
So valuing not just single stocks, but entire stock markets. And, and that's the group that I joined out of college. And I spent four or five years there, left to start a new firm called Kaleidoscope Capital in Boston. We you know, applied some of the same principles of top-down value-based investing, but we focused on more niche markets. So we traded options and you know, author and futures markets, things that GMO clients, given that GMO was a you know, $100 billion firm at the time, would not really have been able to invest in. So these were kind of more niche, um, uncorrelated things. Um, you know, firm grew, we had family office, um, you know, endowment foundation clients. And I, and I left in 2018 to start a new firm um, called Sparkline. And, you know, this is where I currently am and in the process of building it up. But the idea here is to use advances in AI, and in particular natural language processing, to bridge some of the gaps that I see in investing today. Amazing. So there's a lot there. And, and Jeremy Grantham of GMO is actually featured quite prominently in our book. So I have a lot of questions there. But uh, let, let's more focus on you first. So, uh, uh, so tell us a bit more about Sparkline. Why did you start it? And wh what is the overall objective and business of, of Sparkline? Got it. Yeah. So you think about my, about my background, right? I come <laughs> from the world of quantitative investing. Right, which is the idea of can we find systematic principles? Right, think about Ray Dalio, universal and timeless principles that um, predict markets. So, for instance, the traditional value factor, right, is simply saying let's look for stocks that are cheap on price to book and bet on mean reversion, and then short expensive stocks on that factor. And historically, over you know over a hundred years, that premium has been rewarded. Right, the same fact, same principles apply to momentum investing, growth. Um, carry, um, you know, roll down in, in the macro markets. So these, there are these repeatable ideas that you can kind of just run over and over again. And when you kind of roll it as enough times, your edge becomes apparent, right? So that's the school that I initially came from. But unfortunately what's happened is um, while we, we, get, we have faster and faster computers and better and better algorithms, the return to these strategies have, and this is no secret, have started to erode, right? And that's because in my mind, um, you know, these things have become commoditized. It's become you know, too easy now to run these, these factors, right? So let's hold for a second and now focus on you know, the opposite, which is you know, there's a whole other school of investing, right? discretionary investing. In the macro space, you can think of like George Soros. In you know, stocks, obviously Warren Buffett comes to mind. Right? These guys, they can theoretically look at all data. Right? They can get on the calls with the management, they can talk to expert networks, they can follow the news, read the Wall Street Journal, do all these different things. But you know, for them, the challenge is kind of the opposite, right? Which is, as we know, data is being created at an exponential rate, right? More information is being created in the past year as of all of human history, right? And so you can just fast forward 10 years and you know, we're all kind of drowning in this ocean of data. And you know, unless we update our toolkit, it's gonna to be very difficult to keep pace, right? So. So that's the setup, right? Which is we have these two schools, which are completely disjoined. They, they kind of don't talk to each other. And we have opposite problems. We both have one part of the puzzle, but can't solve it individually, right? And that's where, you know, I believe there's a huge opportunity, which is can we actually um, marshal our technology um, prowess machines to process unstructured data, which is, you know, a kind of technical term for the information that discretionary investors look at, right? And, and one thing Sean actually mentioned is, that unstructured data is 80% of information. So only 20% of the data is in SQL databases or, SQL or, or Excel spreadsheets. The other 80% is unstructured. It's text, it's audio, it's images. And by the way, that ratio has grown through time because data is being created at a faster rate than we can structure it. So it's you know, almost just a matter of time before the information that quants look at, the structured data, price, volume, P ratios, becomes just such a sliver of the information that's available and that's just not going to be a sustainable path. And so it's almost a necessity that we can do this. And you know, that's what you know, I've spent my time at Sparkline focused on, which is developing this toolkit, machine learning and, and AI, and in particular natural language processing as a way of systematically going through the information and in, say, you know, the MDNA section of a 10K, right? A, a Wall Street Journal article taking this information and bringing it into a process by which it becomes accessible to a machine. Um, that's a, a, um, a thing that's only really become available to investors in the past few years. Right? And, and, and that's thanks a lot to spillovers from 
Silicon Valley, right? You have you know, the big tech companies doing a ton of great work, innovating in this space, but their goal, of course, is you know, tagging their friends in photos, um, not, and, and obviously, you know, from our standpoint, where you and I sit, our goal would be to say, can we take this technology and translate it in a way that it becomes useful for our use case, you know, which is namely finding good stocks. Okay, so I, I this is as you know I, I'm more focused on the value fundamental longer term side. So this is a bit new to me, but I think I'm following. So you're you're taking this this uh, this massive volumes and growing volumes of data, unstructured data, and trying to make sense of it in your investments. Uh, Kai, can you give me and give my audience an example of let's say recent trade slash investment you did using this approach? Sure. Yeah. You know, when, when coronavirus first hit, right. So mm -hmm. we had March, um, you know, the narrative evolved through multiple phases. And if you remember at the very beginning, it was very much focused on China and to the extent that the, China, that, that the virus in China would affect the, the supply chain of, you know, all these companies that relied on say manufacturing or intermediate goods from that area. Right. Then after that, it evolved further. And then you know you have all then you have the lockdown related um, issues and you, know, you have all these different steps and so I think for a lot of quantitative investors it was very challenging because they were often you know their risk models are very static very backward looking where you say let's look at the historical correlations of stock prices and use that to predict where you know what where the risks lie. Now one of the one of the things that I've been doing is not using statistical risk models but fundamental risk models. So in other words, defining risk vectors along the dimensions of things like China supply chain. Um, and in, in doing so, you know, being able to pick out what is it that is driving the variance in markets, right? Because if you remember February and March, everything just moved to a ridiculous amount and risk models, um, you know, value at risk and all those things that just blew up and a lot of traditional quant factors, right? So value investing, small cap investing, all these things that you know you expect to potentially hold up did not, right? And so that's so this is kind of a long way of saying um, it's not so much a trade, I guess, but it's more by using natural language processing to to look through textual documents, figure out each company's exposure to fundamental factors such as again supply, China supply chain, you know, being able to then isolate risks accordingly. Okay, so can you translate that into an actual investment? Or a trade, so so you so you you're crunching all this data. You're trying to make some sense of it, and then what does what's the conclusion? What's the action oh, from, from so, that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so let, let me give you I guess a better example. That's probably more sure. in, in line with the way that you know you you probably think. So um, think about the shift, right? We all know looking back that the big thing that happened in coronavirus was a shift of demand from brick and mortar to online. Right, with, with with the benefit of hindsight, it's blindingly obvious. Right, how how could that not happen? Right, this you know secular trend towards e-commerce, for instance, was only accelerated by the necessity of lockdown. Well, you know the criticism that quant models always get is that you know we can't predict the future. Right, we're just looking at historical patterns, and just by definition, how can you predict a regime shift? Right, but you know there's two things that I would say in response to that. So first of all, these are not these are not um, kind of black swan events, right? The fact is, as I mentioned, that, um, you know, demand has been shifting online gradually for a long time, right? The retail apocalypse has been a theme that has been, you know, in the kind of zeitgeist for, for decades now. Um, and so this is, happens to be the acceleration of that theme, but, you know, it's the same thing. So as long as your portfolio is positioned uh, to benefit from that, yeah, you get a little lucky that it happened faster than you expected, um, but it's still there. And then the other thing is me measuring digital demand, right? One of the things that quants are good at, right, is being able to kind of keep tabs on a variety of real-time data sources, right? So, you know, everyone knows about like Google Trends and transaction data, you know, things like that. These are just specific examples, but, you know, there are many things that I'm looking at that are kind of real-time indicators that, w that did actually show that this that consumers are shifting demand to these kind of online channels in in real time faster than say you know the quarterly earnings reports that you know companies are required to disclose 
would have revealed. And so it's not so much, so the second piece is not so much being able to predict, but being able to react in a more nimble way than like a traditional analyst um, who, you know, may or may not get it right. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who are very um, clever and, and figure it out really quick, but then there are plenty, plenty of other people and, you know, the market obviously being the average of, you know, everyone, you know, all the different minds being a little bit flat footed um, in, in such an event. Sure, got gotcha. Now that makes sense. So I think for 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 those of us, uh, myself included, that were in Asia during SARS, we 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 lived through that and we saw that companies like Ali and and Tencent benefited from that episode. And so I think from a macro historical standpoint, it is not. It wouldn't be surprising if other perhaps older investors might say, "Hey, you know, digital makes sense." But what Sparkland does beyond sort of that macro intuition or history is you would collect sort of data that typically isn't used by, um, let's say, normal investor to sort of accelerate and approve that thesis. Is, is that, would that be correct summary? Yeah, and, and all, all these data points are things that, you know, with the benefit of time, one can sit down with and be like, Piece it together. Okay, so this is how the this is how the the, the picture looks after kind of putting each piece of the puzzle together. Um, the advantage of being a quant is you can just do it a lot quicker and you can do it in real time. Versus gotcha, for most gotcha. people, they're now putting it together kind of after the fact, being like, well, yeah, obviously this is what happened, but you know, it's easy to say again with the benefit of hindsight. Okay, so so this sparkling, um, what kind of uh, data are you collecting? Are, are you like a Renaissance or GMO? You've got these massive computers, or 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 are you more looking at specific pieces or sort of a proprietary mix of data sets for your own trading or investing? Uh, are you are you guys hard, uh, you know high tech hard tech or are you more more the more uh, proprietary? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm asking the question, but I think you know what I mean, right? Like like. Uh, are you competing with the big boys? Do you need to, or this is something different? Um, yeah, I mean, so, 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 so I apologize. Let me rephrase. So when I imagine, as you said earlier, the large shops, the quant shops have so much computing power. They're just feeding, feeding data into the system that a typical day trader cannot compete. Right. Uh, so I have a relative who's a day trader. He's trying to learn the the the, the TA, and and we keep saying you can, it's really tough to compete against the big boys that have all that data already, right? Wh where does Sparkline fit? Got it. In that realm, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't want to fit with too broad a brush, but mm -hmm. it does tend to be the case that you know the characterization of these big quant firms who have reams and reams of data tend to be focused more on structured data, right? So. Okay. You know, these guys are naming any names are the best at what they do and they are as you as you point out doing probably a better job than you know the than the average day trader in executing um you know thousands of trades across um using higher frequency data or using a lot of structured data so my focus has been a little bit different right because i'm not trying to compete with them head on that wouldn't be, make much sense um since it's a losing battle so instead i'm saying well maybe not maybe i shouldn't focus on trying to build a better mousetrap and you know, process unstructured process structured data in a faster and more and, and more powerful way than than those guys do. Instead, let's you know move to the other eighty percent, the kind of untapped resource of unstructured data that you know to to the, to the you know as far as I can tell, most of the big firms are not relying heavily on. So I say that that okay. would be the main distinction. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And, and I, I I want to move on to your August September pieces, Pat, yeah. but. Uh, it, it, in your portfolio for Sparkline, um, are you investing in a in a stock? Are you investing in an ETF? What what's the asset you're you're buying, and what's the holding period, and what's the typical portfolio size, and and, and, and the, that number of holdings? Yeah, so the asset class is is single aim stocks. Okay. Like Apple, okay. that that kind of stuff. Gotcha, um, gotcha. Because you know ETFs are great and they're super liquid. If that's your goal, is to trade a lot. The nice thing mm -hmm. about single stocks is that you have more breadth. Okay. Because quant comes down to exploiting an edge over many, many at bats. And the more at bats you have, um, the more, the less the variance, the less the noise, and the more the signal emerges. Um, and so that answers your, I guess, your second question, which is how many names, right? It's, it's going to be in the thousands. Are you buying thousands of stocks? 
Right. Wow. Wow. Okay. And what's the holding period? It varies. It varies. But uh, typically, are you in and out the same day or are you really no. buying these? No, no. These are long, like what? Uh, yearly holds and monthly holds or it really all depends? So probably more in the monthly range. And again, this comes down to where is the opportunity, right? Because high okay. frequency trading, intraday trading is pretty competitive right now. And it's a bit of an arms race. And on the other hand, super long-term investing, it's hard to really get that many at-bats, right? Because you can, going back to the idea of at-bats, it's not just how many stocks you hold, it's also how many swings you have over the course of a given period of time. And if I only buy a stock and hold it for every 10 years, then it becomes a little bit challenging um, to get okay. time series laws. What, what, one of the 10 commandments in our book is uh, diversify, don't over diversify, right? So a thousand stock is, is, is a lot of stocks. So a lot of the, uh, the buy sells, uh, um, most of these automated triggered by criteria you set ahead of time. How do you, how do you manage a thousand stocks with this, as a small firm? Well, it's all computerized. So it's mm -hmm. the, the actual implementation is actually pretty trivial, but let's okay. go back to your point. I think that's kind of interesting, right? You're saying, one of the principles is to diversify, but not to over diversify, right? Yes. And so I guess the kind of the interesting thing is that I don't believe that I'm over diversified, but I just view bets in a different way than, you know, a traditional person might, right? So the average person says, all right, well, I have 10 stocks, so I have 10 bets, right? What I'm saying is, well, I have, imagine you had 10 stocks, but they're all like big tech names, right? Then you really just have one, mm -hmm. bet, which is I bet that big talk, big tech's going to do well versus not. Right. You know, the big antitrust report came out yesterday, right? If the Democrats sweep and, you know, there's a paradigm shift in the way that, you know, the DOJ and FTC conduct their business, well, all the stocks are going to go down. Right. So in a way you're not diversified, even, you know, even though you have 10 different things. So I'm thinking of things, you know, and I hate to use the word factor, but more in factor space. Right. So for me, it's how many factors do I have exposure to? Not so much how many names. And in fact, having more names allows me to diversify away idiosyncratic risk, which is the risk that, you know, I, I may be completely right that say value investing is going to work, but I just get caught up unlucky in like one stock that happens to go to zero for some fraud that is totally unrelated to what I'm doing. And so by having lots of names, you diversify away that and you can isolate what are the actual factors that you care about. So, you know, mm. digital demand, like what are the themes that matter? And, um, you know, on that dimension, you know, I don't have, I, I would say as many as it, as it might sound. Okay, great. All right. Uh, now let's get to your August letter. Uh, um... Uh, I, there, there's some amazing, and, and I would encourage whoever is listening or watching to please, please go to Sparkline and, and, and uh, Kai will give the, um, the address later and, and read that report. It's an easy read, but it's a fascinating read. Maybe Kai can just give us sort of, let's start with the August letter about the big tech eating value investing. Maybe tell us sort of that thesis, how you got to that, and maybe the, the key conclusions you drew and implications for value investors such as myself. I, I'm just excited to hear this. Yeah. Right. So... Obviously, value investing has a grand tradition. It kind of dates back to Ben Graham and security analysis in the 30s. Um, and, you know, Graham was really interesting because he was actually maybe, you could argue, one of the first ones where he really yes. advocated for rules-based approaches to valuing companies. And, you know, you have to keep in mind that back in the day, most of the economy was industrial. So things were kind of hard, tangible assets. And so you looked for things that were trading below that and you bought it, right? So it was maybe a little bit more simple than it is today. But well, regardless, that was the framework that a lot of quants, including my former boss, Jeremy, in the 70s and 80s, pioneered um, and has since then, you know, due to its massive success and the kind of academic support around it, become a huge industry, right? So many ETFs and mutual funds and, and active funds are all benchmarks to value, value benchmarks, right? And what that generally means, and obviously everyone's definition of value is different, but it generally means, you know, go long or overweight. Um, low price of book stocks and short or underweight high price of book stocks. And, you know, there are other ways of looking at this. You could look at price to cash flows, price to earnings, even the EBITDA. I mean, there's plenty of different ratios, but they're all pretty highly correlated. And what's happened is, you know, as money's flown in, unfortunately, performance hasn't been there. So over the past 13 years, um, the strategy defined in, in a variety of different ways, value investing has not worked. And, you know, what started as a slow trickle has become a torrent. And, you know, in fact, the performance has accelerated down and, you know, really culminated this year with COVID as just kind of being awful, right? So value has not done well the past 13 years. And so that's a setup. Um, on the other hand, right, you 
we'll often hear people say, well, you know, there are plenty of reasons that value is down, but one thing that I should point to is the fact that value looks cheap now, right? So, um, you know, the, the portfolio of cheap stocks and the portfolio of expensive stocks. You can look at the spread between those two things and look at that through time. Well, it turns out that aside from the tech bubble, which we all know what happened after that, um, value stocks are the cheapest they've ever been, right? So two standard deviations cheap relative to that average spread. And so proponents of value will point to the fact that, hey, look, value is super cheap today, and it's positioned to have a massive historic rally, uh, you know, a, a 3x, um, you know, run against growth. And maybe it will, but that's the kind of million dollar question, so to speak. And, you know, there are people who will kind of line themselves on both sides and, um, you know, it's super interesting. So the most common explanation that you'll hear as to why value has failed recently has been technology, right? Oh, well, value is just kind of buying all these value traps and these broken business models, you know, putting all this money into Macy's and, you know, shorting Amazon. Well, you know, that actually might be true. But what's quite interesting is that whenever academic or quantitative researchers have tried to demonstrate that, they haven't been able to, right? And that's because what most people do is they rely on what, what we call industry classifications, right? So this is a static one zero mapping where each company is assigned to an industry. So for example, Google is a communications company, uh, Apple is a technology company. Um, but the thing is that companies can only be mapped to one thing at a time. So Tesla can either be an auto company or it can be a tech company, it can't be both. Right. And when you actually decompose the constituents of the value index, right, what you find is that, yes, it's making a, sh a, big, a bet on short tech. But if you look at the names within the technology universe, really what it's doing is it's betting against the most disruptive technology companies and betting long the least disruptive ones, the kind of old economy tech companies. So, you know, what my thesis going in is it's not so much that value is betting against technology it's bidding against disruption, right? And I'll get into the methodology in a second, but what I found is that if you're able to classify companies as either disruptive or non-disruptive, um, the value uh, factor has a very strong um, short bet against this disruption factor, right? So another way of framing this is think about like the technology industry. Within the technology industry, there are disruptive companies and non-disruptive companies. Um, value is all things equal, picking the least disruptive companies within technology. And now go to like utilities or financials, some kind of old stodgy field. Well, it turns out that there are still disruptors in those industries. They happen to be a smaller percentage of those industries. And again, value is homing in on the least disruptive guys in each of these industries and growth is the opposite, right? So what's quite interesting is if you, you can neutralize the performance of value to any factor, right, it's a standard quantitative thing. And if you neutralize value to the industry factors, in other words, you only buy the cheapest stocks within technology, short the most expensive stocks within technology, et cetera, what you find is actually that value still underperforms. So industry neutral neutralization defined by classifications is not helping. But then when you go out and you say, well, let's neutralize by these disruptive classifications, um, then you find it does explain 100% of the drawdown, right? So this is all just a long way of saying that yes, actually the reason why value has failed the past 13 years is because it's been short these disruptive companies, but not that it's short technology per se, but just more that it's short the technological disruptors, whether they are you know, um, a company in the technology pure tech industry or the most disruptive company in you know, consumer staples. Okay, so Kai, where, is is going what's the trend going to be because it seems to me unless regulators step in which we're seeing now right uh whenever monopolies come become too powerful um especially in the software internet space where marginal cost is negligible or zero it it gets more and more concentrated to the big to the big tech big names right so so what's the conclusion here that Big tech keeps eating the world and killing value unless somebody steps in. What, so what's, I actually what's think, the implication for, for value investors, for investors overall? So I think there's two things at play here, right? So let's separate the two issues at hand. First, we have disruptive technology. Let's put aside large caps. So actually the paper in, in August that I wrote 
I e used equal weighted portfolios. And what that means is that I put as much weight on the you know, 3,000th biggest name as the first biggest name as Apple. So in other words, I explicitly try to avoid um, conflating the issue of monopoly power, which is the second thing um, with technology. And so one thing that we're seeing, in, and this is what I talked about in the first paper in August, is that disruptive companies, um, you know, small or large, are, um, are harming value, value is making a, a bet against these guys and that hasn't worked out well for them. The second point, which I make in the last paper, is on monopoly power. And you know, the kind of interesting thing is that I started off by saying, all right, let's focus on big tech monopolies, right? How Amazon, Google, and Facebook, and, and Apple, are using their monopoly power to extract, um, you know, rents, in, you know, and in, in a way that becomes effectively impenetrable. The game is rigged against anyone who tries to, to be, take them down. Well, it turns out that that thesis, that narrative, actually was not correct. And you know, as I dug deeper, I realized that actually monopolies and and this rise of monopoly power that we've seen has been happening before a lot of these tech companies were even founded, and has been um, so widespread across all industries. Right. And so it's almost like a whole nother, another thing. Yes, these mega cap tech stocks are kind of the pinnacle, the kind of uh, best manifestation of it because of the you know, idea of scalability and technology and how, how it is in itself a monopolist. It, uh, it creates a winner take all dynamic, which kind of creates more concentration of power for monopolies. But what you're finding is that, you know, whether it's airlines, beer, you know, pharmacy benefit managers, I mean, so many industries you're seeing basically two to three players control 80% of the market, right? So name a market, it's probably the case that three players control 80% of it, right? And that hasn't always been the case. It's been, you know, a process since the 80s and, you know, due in, in part to changes in antitrust frameworks, but also just, you know, a wave of consolidation and potentially globalization and technology, um, these, these mega trends that have been occurring that have led to consolidation within each industry. And so for value investors, it's kind of a double whammy. Right, because now they're fighting against two things. So first, they are short disruption, which has been obviously challenging the past 10 years. And second, they're short monopoly, right? Because the market knows that these big companies have an advantage, right? The market is, is not dumb. It's like, yeah, of course, you know, you shouldn't fight against Amazon. If you want to fight against Amazon, like, I don't want to buy you. And so that the valuation show that. And so just, you know, putting aside even the technology aspect, um, value investors are effectively going to be long, you know, numbers four to N in any industry and short numbers one to three. And that's a pretty tough trade. Yeah, so I just, I just read your September piece on monopolies. Some, I mean, like the August piece, it, there's a lot of great insights there. I think towards the end, you talked about uh, Berkshire Buffett um, really picking, picking his portfolio based on monopolies, if not oligopolies, pretty much, right? Uh, airlines, you, you, you mentioned, you mentioned the investment in credit cards and, and, and banks really taking pieces of these so that he is intentionally, unintentionally really buying into the pricing power of those concentrated players. Yeah. Right. I, and I think it's worth just, you know, for your listeners talking of again, about that, that airline trade, right? So in, in mm -hmm. for years and years, Buffett sat there joking and making fun of airlines, right? He even said at one point that, you know, if, um, the Wright brothers had been showered with the sky, it would have been a, you know, they would have been doing a favor to investors um, down the line because these companies were such money losers. And then what happened was, you know, years of consolidation when all these companies got merged into, you know, three or four big companies that dominated 80% of, you know, US domestic flights. And suddenly they had pricing power. And then Buffett didn't just buy one of them, he bought all of them. He said, I'm going to put 10% of my money into each of the big um, for U.S. airlines, and by the way, that was a great trade, right? Because he recognized very clearly that what what had happened was an industry that was initially a horrible money loser became quite attractive from an investment standpoint because they had developed that concentration. And you know that was kind of what I talked about in the paper. Is if you were to apply that again systematically across all industries through time, um, you you generate you know also some positive excess returns. So, so he did, did that with Coke, but not Pepsi. He bought Coke. Uh, he bought at one point, I think pre-COVID, when I looked at the last year's annual report, he had 14 bank stocks. Yeah. I mean, I, he had essentially 
the majority of the biggest bank financial stocks, right? Yes. Which, so you're saying essentially he is, that's part of his strategy is, is to, to buy into the pricing power of a few, if not monopoly, sort of an oligopoly players. Right. I mean, and, and he's said it himself, right? He's said that he's looking for companies that have pricing power, right? That are mm -hmm. so, that the business model is so infallible that, you know, your idiot nephew could run it. Those are the things that he looks for. Yes, but l looking at the various verticals, I think I think um, it hasn't really worked that well for Berkshire, though, right? If he didn't have Apple, it would be a very really, really bad stock the last couple of years, certainly this year. Except he made sixty-five billion dollars on that trade. I understood, but I'm <laughs> saying the the so so Apple obviously is the big tech monopoly uh, in many ways, as your report says. But his other monopoly of pricing power plays really didn't work out that well. I mean, right? The the, the stock and the portfolio has been lifted by Apple. Really, that one that's, trade. That's it. Yeah, I mean, and granted, it's it's a little bit unfair to be like, all right, I'm gonna take your bit your best trade away from you because then, yeah, you know, by the you know by definition, gotcha, you're, gotcha. It is a portfolio. Sure, but but that being said, that I think the the question that I would ask and I haven't run the analysis, is how do those other stocks do relative to their industry? So one thing industry. to keep in mind is that financials have not done well. It's the flip side of yep. the technology yep. trade. Um, and so, yeah, Buffett ha happens to be highly concentrated in financials for a variety of reasons. Um, I'd you know, be interested to ask, is the, um, the stock that he owns in the financials space- That's fair, that's fair. Form yep. The industry yep. at, at large, in which case he does have alpha. He just happens to have made a at least sure. a really incorrect bet on tech, on uh, on financials. That that makes sense. I mean, he, he's constructing a diversified portfolio, and, and as you said, you got to look at the overall, not just yeah. So I I think I think that's fair. Uh, I guess my question is, let's put Berkshire aside. Going forward, do you see tech monopoly plays being a bit more sustainable longer term versus other monopolistic plays? or non-tech plays? So I'd say yes, in general, um, with the caveat that the, you know, four big companies that are kind of in the crosshairs of Congress, I would definitely be a little bit more wary of, right? Like we know that governments are notorious for, you know, over-promising and under-delivering. So it's quite possible that nothing happens, right? And there's some kind of partisan bickering and, and nothing actually comes of this, but there is definitely political risk there, um, which is unique to these four firms. And, but, you know, there are plenty of tech monopolies that are monopolies in more niche markets that um, you do not have that same risk. Um, you know, and, and those companies, I would actually be bullish on. And this is why, right? So think about what the explanation, and I talk about this in the paper as well, is for the rising concentration in industries. Right? There's kind of two different narratives. On one hand, you could argue that it's these um, kind of uh, robber baron mentality companies they're going in and you know using predatory pricing and anti-competitive techniques to crush their, their competition and thereby secure a moat and be able to charge um, you know above market uh, prices, right? Or squeeze suppliers, earn above market profits. Let me be more, be more specific, specific. On the other hand, the competing narrative is: look, we just happen to be living through a period in which technology and globalization are changing the world, right? Think about a world where without globalization, where we each live in our small towns and every town had their own, you know, uh, Walmart, own, own a retailer, or their own, you know, factory, et cetera. Well, you have a captive market and you can only grow so big. What globalization does is it makes it into one massive market. And now it's like this big pond where, you know, co through competition, eventually it's winner take all, right? The spoils are larger for those who win. And then for everyone who can't win, gets crushed. And you think with technology, it's the same thing. Right before the advent of like sound recording, we had you know bands and singers and musicians who basically didn't compete with each other, right? Because if you're going to throw a wedding, you're going to have that band. Well, nowadays it's like we all just listen to Taylor Swift, and that's pretty much it, right? and, and we're done, right? So um, you know that that's what's happened with technology. So technology and globalization are these forces that potentially are kind of creating this secular shift towards winner take all dynamics, towards monopoly dynamics, where maybe it doesn't even make sense to have more than one or two players in each industry. Like they're talking about breaking up tech monopolies. Well, let me ask you this, which is, are there synergies that we get? Are there economies of scale that we get as consumers only having to face off against tech monopolies? Right, like 
a great example is financial, ex financial exchanges. There's a few exchanges. Imagine there was like a thousand financial exchanges. Liquidity would be fragmented. That may not be bad, but it's just something to point out. Or like, imagine instead of having Facebook, there are a thousand small Facebooks and all your friends are scattered across different Facebooks. That would actually be a little bit annoying, wouldn't it? So, you know, yep. maybe you can yep. argue that there are natural monopolies. And, you know, this is uh, just a simple economics point, which is in industries where there's high fixed costs relative to marginal costs. So, you know, it takes a ton of money to build a nuclear power plant, a nuclear fusion plant. And then the marginal cost of an additional unit kilowatt hour is, is zero. Well, in those industries, maybe they should be a monopoly and perhaps you regulate it in a different way than a more competitive arena. And technology is very much that way. Right? When I write a piece of software, um, you know, the marginal cost of producing that digital unit of software is zero, but you know, there's a huge amount of R&D that went up into setting it up up front. Um, and that's kind of the barrier to entry for anyone else who wants to take that from me. Yeah, I think it's tricky. Uh, obviously, as you said, as you stated just earlier, and also in your paper, it, this is not the first time that monopolies have emerged and, and, and exist and, and become dominating. You know, uh, you're younger, but I lived through the AT and T breakup, right? And, and so what you just said actually applies. Huge capex. There's a huge argument. There's a massive argument to keep it a monopoly because because of deficiency and whatnot, right? But most countries have decided to go without olig oligopoly, right? Which seems to be the case. Obviously, prior to that, there's steel, but in, as, as you report, so there's many other oligopoly monopolies. Um, my personal view is big tech internet. It's it's harder. It's harder because it, it's it's so integrated, right? Facebook wouldn't be Facebook without a lot of integrations and similar to Google and similar to Amazon. So I, I'm not sure. What do you think? What's going to happen? What will be broken up eventually? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if anything is going to happen. Um, you know, I think there are different proposals, right? There's the idea of breaking up companies. And then there's the idea of like the Chinese wall equivalent, which is to like say, okay, so Amazon, you have this marketplace and that's great. You can continue to run that. And you can have your own products, but you can't like use your privileged position here to take advantage of that. It's like the net neutrality, you know, equivalent for. Yeah. Uh, do, do you see? Yeah, I think anything that's government driven would, would, would take decades. Um, especially since big tech is global, it's pervasive, right? It's not like Google is just in America, right? It, it's quite, it's quite, quite integrated globally. Do you see any possibilities in the blockchain space with decentralization to potentially take some of this power away? Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I actually traded block uh, crypto back in the day. This is really, really early days for crypto, but no, I, I mean, I haven't really been following the space. Um, I mean, it's, it remains to be seen, I guess. Um, you know, this yeah. Is, yeah. You know, blockchain seems interesting, but you know, as long as all the servers that run are on AWS. It's not truly free. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the, the ideal of blockchain and, and Bitcoin and Satoshi is, I mean, it's tied to monopolies and power, right? In, in many ways, financial power and government power and how everything's concentrated or power con concentrated. YouTube, you know, uh, paying a tax to YouTube, the Apple, app, Apple store and decentralization is supposed to be a way of getting around that. Um, still a lot of romance around that, a lot of activity. I just curious whether you've studied that and whether you think that is potentially one force that might mitigate the monopolies. But as you said, I don't know myself. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so back to you, August, uh, again, you make, you make a really, I mean, I mean, value investing is obviously a thing, a big thing. What, what, I mean, what's your advice to value investors? Give up and go to growth? <laughs> no, that's the worst What's possible thing you can do, right? Like that's the worst possible, and that's selling low, right? Definitely don't want to do that. So uh, I'm sorry. So 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 uh, let's say I'm a fund manager. I've raised a fund that's doing value, right? I'm getting my ass kicked by growth and tech. What what I mean? You, you, you see reversion? Did you did do you see this keep keep uh, ongoing for a while? So I think it helps here to kind of decompose what are the reasons for the, for the drawdown, right? And I already gave okay. you a few things. So first being short disruption and second being short monopolies, right? So I think what you want to do is you want to say, what are all the things? And those are just two. I'm sure there are many other reasons. People talk about interest rates, accounting policies, blah, 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 blah. Come up with your list of different things is the first thing I would do. 
The second thing I would do is then say, for each one, do I believe this is a permanent shift or is this going to mean revert? Right? So the monopoly one is kind of a tough issue. I, I mean, I don't know where I stand on this, but I could see it mean reverting. I could also see it not. I don't know. I mean, I think we should see how the election goes. We should see how the Supreme Court appointment goes. Um, I would you know, want to do a lot more work on the space, but that's an important question to ask, to answer. If I were a value investor, I'd be spending my time thinking about that. I would also be thinking a lot about um, you know, the valuations of tech companies in general. So put aside big tech companies, just in general techno technology um, as a disruptive force. Right, so you think about you think about technology. Yes, you know companies that um, deal in cloud, deal in AI, robotics. These companies have sky high valuations, and they've done so well the past ten years. And being underweight and short, these companies crushed you. But you know, has has it gone too far? Because you can think back to two thousand, which you know you mentioned. I mean, you lived through, and that was kind of a case where yes, technology was very disruptive, but the narrative got overblown. Right. I mean, you, you look at this in the Bitcoin market all the time, right? I mean, you know, there, there's all these big booms and busts and bubbles in Bitcoin. If people get excited and then they kind of pull back, right? You know, how it will end up, I don't know. But, you know, you have to ask the question, which is, is the tech disruption narrative overdone? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. And, you know, those are the questions I'd be answering. I don't, I'm not going to, you know, profess to know the answer to all these questions, but I think that's a framework I would give a value investor for thinking about this because, you know, the first step is just recognizing the implicit bets you're making. You're not just simply sitting there buying cheap stocks, selling expensive stocks. I wish it were that simple. What you're actually doing is you are, you know, betting on these various themes that, you know, may or may not mean revert. And it, in your job as an investor should be to know what you're doing and then to form views on all those things you're doing and, you know, figure out how to adjust in each case, right? Because you can obviously tilt your portfolio in any way you want. If you thought, for instance, that, you know, technology was a, was a secular trend, that you should not be bidding against that, but you thought that big, uh, so the big tech, that monopolies were going to mean revert, that antitrust was going to come in and, and quash them, right? Then what you would do is you tilt your portfolio to um, not, to avoid the big tech names, but focus in on technology in general, and you'd kind of, you know, neutralize or remove your short bias towards technology, right? So you can kind of like pick into these little pieces individually, depending on your individual view. Let's push this a bit deeper. I just want to get more of your insights. So you mentioned three major trends, uh, the 2009, you know, late 90s, 2000.com. Yes, I lived through that. I was part of that. I raised 60 million for my own dot com. Uh, that, you know, that was a great story without profits and whatnot, right? So, so I think, you know, I think the headlines are saying quite often that today's big tech is, is different. It's driven by the monopoly guys with profits to show, right? Yeah. So, so I think, I think, um, I, I believe in the, I believe in the, in the argument that this one is a bit more sustainable. Now, whether or not, you know, Apple should be two trillion versus one trillion, that's a valuation issue, but it's not, it's not a BS story, right? Yeah. You talked about uh, big, uh, blockchain and crypto. I also spent three years uh, not trading. I was I, I participated in ICOs and I, I was looking for, I searched really hard for practical and real applications of blockchain technology, in, in particular in decentralized applications, because I think, I think there was a lot of romance driving that. And if there's a way to use that technology to replace some of the things that are controlled by these monopolies, then maybe there's a case for it. Um, that was 2017, uh, 17, 2018. To date, I still haven't seen a real decentralized application. I know there's a lot of activity, maybe it's coming. Um, so given those three trends and given what you said earlier that, you know, uh, size in technology begets more power, more pricing, more profits, then unless something like a decentralized blockchain and or the government comes in to squash the big tech, what stops them? And then circling back to value versus growth, what hope is there for value if there's nothing stopping tech? Well, I think as a value investor, the other thing you can think about is how, well, how, how do you adapt for the world? So actually the current, let me, let me give you a sneak review. So the current okay. thing we're working on right now is on intangible. Uh -huh. On what? Intangible assets. Okay, IP. Because this is kind of the, 
this is the theme that kind of is the undercurrent that's running through the idea of um, technology and scale is the idea that's running through value and you know the teachings of Ben Graham all the way up to Buffett and the evolution of Buffett's strategy away from you know just buying the cigar butts and all the way to what he's doing with you know the greatest trade ever the 65 billion dollars he made on Apple right so the interesting thing is if you look at just the high level data and even just common sense will tell you this that we live in a very different world than we lived in before that intangibles used to be a very small amount of the value of u.s corporations and are now the majority of the value yet accounting rules have not changed right if you think about the balance sheet of apple right it's you know price to book is 25 and when buffett bought it in 2016 it's price to book was four so in other words if book value is meant to be replacement cost, right? The tangible assets the company owns. Apple sits on a bunch of cash, as we know, some bonds. It has some offices and factories and things like that. So it has this much value. Well, there's this much value here, which is unexplained. And so traditional value would be like, wow, this stock Apple is super expensive. Why would I ever buy it? I should short the stock. But the question is, maybe we're missing something, right? Maybe it's the case that traditional financial accounting um, in, you know, practices are missing the fact that there's a vast amount of intangible value that's not being recorded on the balance sheet, right? Whether that's the patents, the brand that Apple commands, the monopoly power that's worked so hard to gain, say the App Store, the supply chain relationship it has, the loyalty amongst consumers, you know, the, the variety of different things, maybe culture, organizational competencies that it's built through training and, you know, various um, investments that those things are not being recorded. So while we capitalize investments in factories. So if I were to build a factory, right, that goes into my balance sheet and then gets, you know, depreciated each year. We don't capitalize um, intangible assets. And, you know, there are good reasons for, for why that might be the case. But, you know, the fact is that there's a huge chunk of the value of these um, knowledge economy businesses that are just missing. And so value investors are just naturally going to say, if all I'm looking at is price to book, and by the way, the same argument applies to price to sale, uh, price to earnings, um, they're just going to be short these companies all day, right? So maybe what value investors need to do is recognize that it's not that value is broken. It's just that the metric they're using for intrinsic value in, in, in general book value, which is what Fama French used is broken. And that, you know, we no longer live in a world with hard, hard assets and we need to adapt for the value, the fact that intangibles, brand, um, IP, all these different things are the majority of corporate assets now. And if we can correctly, if we can figure out how to correctly, capitalize that and, and value that, then we can now adjust our metrics and we'll no longer be short Amazon all day, right? Maybe we still will be actually, but, but we won't be short as much. And we will find that a lot of things we used to hate, we now like, and the things that we you know, love, we now hate, right? Like banks, why do, finan why do value investors love financial so much? Well, it's because like their entire, all their assets are like literally just very neatly laid out on their balance sheet. And so it looks like they're not that expensive, but I mean, that's just their business model. And for us to penalize um, technology companies because their business model depends on technology and intangible assets and to love financials because their business model relies on tangible financial assets just doesn't really seem to make that much sense. And so perhaps that's what value investors need to do. Yeah, it seems Wall Street analysts are always a few steps behind. So even when during the 2000.com, I was CEO of a internet telephony company and the go on IPO and the banks were pushing to have the telecom analysts cover us and write the research. And we like every other internet company saying, no, we're, we're IP based. We're not, you know, PSTN yeah. and we were fighting and selecting the bankers that would allow the internet analysts to cover us, right? Um, so what you just said, I think you could apply to many current stocks. I think probably the noisiest and the most prominent one is Tesla, yeah. right? Right. The, the next time I read a, 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 a Wall Street analyst compare headline saying Tesla is now eight times BMW value, you know, I would puke, right? Because because obviously that grabs headlines, but that's really not the story, right? Mm -hmm. And and you're seeing some of the more uh, sort of emerging players, like I think Kathy Wood from ARK Invest, you, you know, makes out the case. She has analysts from software, from energy and auto and different sectors to try to put the pieces together to value Tesla, right? Mm 
I mean, is this in line with what you're saying is, is, is value needs to adapt to what's happening in particular in tech because tech is so pervasive. Is that accurate? What you just said? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. I mean, the idea of just saying, let's buy things that are cheap relative to intrinsic value as defined by, you know, the factories and, and widgets, you know, machines that you have is outdated. Right. Sure, I don't sure. know about Tesla in specific, but you know, in general, like technology companies, um, you know, biotechs, um, anything that's, you know, more knowledge and information driven, IP driven will certainly have this. Um, also brands, brands are super important, right? Like if I were to do a blind taste test of a bunch of different sodas and I told you afterwards that one of them was called Coke, right? Suddenly that changes your perception of what you just did. And so what is a Coke brand worth? It's worth a lot of money. Right. And the same goes for many, many companies that have invested billions and billions of dollars in promoting their brands. And so you can't just value that at zero. Yeah, that, that's, that's super important too. And so all these things taken together, if you ignore it as a value investor, you're just naturally going to short all these things, right? By omission, you are short all these factors. And that is a very scary thing to be doing in the modern age. Mm. I, I love this. I, I just lo love learning. New, new, new insights and concepts. So thank you. I think uh, tonight, um, just to maybe wrap up, um, you know, we learned Kai has fantastic training from what we call an investment wizard, Jeremy Grantham's GMO fund, um, and then sort of evolve uh, into the second uh, hedge fund that you've started now, a Sparkline, which sounds amazingly promising. A lot of a lot of fresh ideas, at least to me, to me, and. Uh, um, I think another theme that we learned, uh, again, I would encourage everyone to read the August letter is really how big tech is disrupting the whole value investing space. It's something to, to worth looking at. And then your latest news newsletter in September is talking about how it's quite profitable investing in monopolies, including uh, Buffett and others. Um, so, so amazing. Um, Kai, how, how can the, uh, our audience find you and find your research? Can you tell us, if you don't mind, how, how they can access your, your work? Sure, yeah. I mean, I would just go to my website. So mm -hmm. www.sparklinecapital.com. That's S-P-A-R-K-L-I-N-E capital.com. Um, gotcha, gotcha. If you want to talk to me personally, I have a contact form. You can just send me a, send me a note. Okay. And again, I don't, I don't know if you're allowed to say, but uh, is your fund open for investing for investors? And if so, what type of investors, if, if you're not comfortable yeah. accreditation standards, um, you know, if we, if you want to talk, you can, you can reach, reach out offline. Great. Great. Okay. All right. I can't wait for you for your October letter and uh, hopefully get you back here uh, in a few months time to, to learn more. Well, yeah. Thanks a lot, Son, for having me on, on the show. This is, been you know actually a really fun conversation for me so you know no better way for me to spend my wednesday night talking to you than... <laughs> okay <laughs> great thanks kai appreciate it thank you thank you for joining us please visit wizards institute to access the blog summary of today's session to learn more about other speakers and to network with other investment wizards Wizards Institute, the number one community to learn smart investing and financial freedom.